So I'm going to assign the rest of chapter 20. And originally it's going to be for Thursday, but I think I'm going to make that for Friday. And we are going to have a 10 question, if you can multiple choice, and do short ID quiz on Thursday. So it's going to be on that first column. Of, did I get to review this yesterday? We have the first column of the review list. And the reason I'm doing that is because I looked at the review list and realized I was going through the list for the test. And I realized this test would be a killer if I put everything in. And so I decided to divide it up a little bit and make it like a small little, nothing at all like a test. Quiz, which is two short IDs. One of them will have to be on boom bus. And the other ones, I'll uh, give you a couple choices. There are asterisks on this in just the first call. That's it. And then a few multiple choice. It will take you no more than 24 minutes. Half of it. But I realized that the quit, the task would be just an absolute, it'd be a kill if I try to put everything in there. Unless you really want it, though, to be so pretty So just a quiz, it's just these questions, so all the way through, in fact, we're going to go, the last question will be on the uh, populist platform, so into the next hall. It's going to be really amazing, I mean, I'm not kidding. Just a really simple multiple choice. I know what you're thinking, simple, because you're the one writing it, but relatively simple. <laughs> and then two short items. Sound good? But I realize that quiz would just be a monster test, if I made a whole test. So that's me, I'm looking at Thursday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 920 to 934. Yeah. So for that second, uh, short ID, would we just choose the social environment and then platform? Yeah, platform, platform, and uh, platform, platform. Oh, add an after the union. Thank you for saying that. I thought I put an after. Everyone add that. So I'll give you three choices for one. Sound good? Unionism. Hmm? So you you have to do boom bust for a short ID, and then you have a choice between social Darwinism, unionism, and populist one. All right. So just quick boom, write it up. You should be done. I I'm guessing. Oh, more good news. I almost forgot. It's second semester. You're writing sentences. In pen. Anything involving sentences that you turn in, you must it must be in pen from now on. Blue or black pen. Because the AP exam has to be in pen. We gotta get used to doing it so we don't make mistakes. Pins easy to write with. You don't have to press down as hard. I understand the mistake issue. That's where you gotta start practicing. Alright? If it's like a quiz, don't worry about it. You don't know if you do what you want, but if it's involving sentences, it has to be in pen from now on. Alright. So did we get to here? Tammany Hall was the machine that ran what what city? Yes. New York City. And what was the what party was it? Yeah, that was Democratic machine. The Democratic machines ran a lot of the urban areas. We had this weird Democratic Party as the urban party, the Southern Party, and also kind of the Farmers Party. It's, it's a weird group, the Republican from our Farmers Party, and then um, business interests, and the West. It's just this weird combination of parties then. And, of course, it's kind of weird now. And who was the boss that ran New York? Oh, no, that's, we won't worry about boss. Week. What is it called? Stealing from the government. Basically, pocketing extra money, hiding contracts. Yeah, that's correct. What did, what did boss William J. Plunkett call it? Honest. Yeah, honest crap. Because we're doing good stuff with it. And, supposedly. And who was elected president in 1884? Uncle Grover. And what party was Grover? He was a Democrat. He actually the first Democratic president elected since James Buchanan. Remember, Andrew Johnson was a Democrat, but he wasn't elected president. He was elected vice president with Lincoln as part of that union ticket. And 1880, Garfield was elected president. And who was Charles Duteau? 
And that would lead to what law to, re to for the most part, reform civil service, even though they didn't quite work the way they wanted. What law would reform civil service? Yeah, that's the Pendleton Act. And the new president was Chester A. Arthur, and he was obsessed with what? Pants. That could be on the exam. I'm not bad at a pants question, a pants related question. And do we, do we get the ICC? So the ICC, do we get to this? Did I, did I read you that little quote about using, so it was filled with railroad men? Yeah. Do we get to no power to enforce? All right, so the president would appoint them. By the way, the ICC would be eliminated in the 1980s. It, it's now called the Overland Transport Board. And they're responsible for monopolies in railroads. They're responsible a little bit on truck traffic. They don't have a lot of power to enforce, but it's still called the OTB. And um, with that, in 1888, Grover Cleveland would now run for re-election against Benjamin Harrison. Harrison's uncle, you might remember, the president who died of cholera right after he was elected, right after he was inaugurated, probably almost certainly cholera, and that's his grandson. Another president from Ohio. Ohio was, Ohio dominated Republican politics. That's the thing about having one state controlled by a party. It is a fairly big populist state. And so that's right here. A lot of electoral votes. It still has a fairly good number, but back then a lot more. And this was a razor thin election. And Democrats actually held a slight majority in, this, in the Congress. And Cleveland won the popular vote. But Harrison won the electoral vote. And that is why Republicans seen the razor thin margin in electoral college and look like they might be the minority party in the House and the Senate. That is why he literally right after the election, um, they're able to push through these states to be admitted, hoping for more Republican states. And for a while, it didn't work that way. They're actually fairly Democratic, especially Montana. But now they're all pretty solidly Republican. It just, I guess, it might take 120 years or so. But that's why these states all came to the Union at the same time. That's why they all came in. And tiny populations. And that's why it was Dakota Territory, but they would make two Dakotas. That's why. And most of you probably do agree with me. One Dakota is probably one Dakota too many, right? Yeah. Two? That's why there's two. And they're really small population-wise states. In Wyoming, what is that, 530,000 people? It's half the size population-wise of Montana. And Montana's small population-wise. So with that, so 1890, I forgot to put the year, so write down 1890. But Republicans and Democrats both knew, both knew that their popular clamor for reforms and it was about this time when people began to realize that the ICC wasn't working. The ICC had no real method to enforce railroad rates. Harrison appointed railroad men. The ICC immediately was uh, turning to a big disappointment. And the point was they thought, okay, finally, we're gonna regulate railroad rates, farmers will get a fair shake. No, farmers are small business, not gonna happen. Same thing with other reforms. So in 1890, that was, we've got to pass some laws. The first one is going to be one of the most, well, three really important laws. One law that's kind of the hardest to understand, but had the first, the biggest immediate impact. It's going to be the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. And the law was that the United States government would purchase 4.5 million, I'm sorry, 4 million dollars worth of silver every month or 4.5 million ounces by the way that was the popular abbreviation for ounce at that time they would buy silver so that's going to pump 4.5 million dollars into the economy every month that's a lot of money back then now, today it's a drop in the bucket for all we have 4.5 million in our wallet but a lot of money by the way this would make butte butte was dead they got all the gold out of there they could, and they weren't um, going very well. And back then, does anyone have or seen silver dollars from this time? 
They're Morgan silver dollars, 1880s, and a little bit later peace dollars. So people have seen them. Yeah, that was my uh, my aunt would give me a silver dollar for my birthday for years. One of those when I was a little kid. And looking back, what what a really good gift. And what a nice gift. Well, the U.S. government did not pay to mint those silver dollars. They bought and minted gold, but not silver. So let's say you were a mine, you ran a mine, and you mined silver. You had to pay like the mint, the brand new mint in Denver. There's still a Denver mint to mint those coins. So that means minting silver coins is kind of expensive. And so two things. First off, Butte ran out of gold. They were mining silver, so weren't making money. All of a sudden, now they started buying all this silver. That made Butte. That saved Butte. And I think I mentioned this once before. Wherever there's silver. What other important metal, especially for the new industrial, second industrial revolution, is always next to silver? Copper. copper. It saved the mines just when copper was becoming in demand, so copper could become, will make Butte. And in less than 30 years, Butte's going to have 120,000 people because of copper. That's why Butte's a big ghost town. That's why Butte is like a really cool and also kind of weird. I like Butte a lot, but it's weird. And that's part of the reason why. Well, the thought was when they did this, the assumption was, it's not in the law, the assumption was they're going to mint, they're going to buy this and mint silver dollars. Why? Farmers wanted inflation. They wanted prices to go up so they could start paying back their, what's the number one problem with farmers? <laughs> not with farmers. What's the problem with farmers? The problem that farmers have. So, did it create inflation? No. They never actually minted coins. They took silver ignits and bars and put it in the basement of the old U.S. Treasury. When that basement was filled, they just started filling the basement off of like the War Department and various places. Just the basement was silver. So they bought silver but didn't create inflation. Now, this would a little bit of stimulus to the economy, especially when they're actually coming to a little bit of overproduction. So it might have pushed the uh, depression that's coming down the road a couple years, but didn't solve what they wanted. By the way, remember William Tecumseh Sherman, the general? This is his older brother who was in the Senate from Ohio. And he was a very prominent senator, not because he, uh, <laughs> not because he was this brilliant legislator, his brother guy, I think, got all the intelligence, but he had been in the Senate for a long time, and he was from Ohio. So that's why he got to sponsor the bill. His brother had passed away the year before. This would follow by another disappointing bill. Once again, with Sherman, John Sherman, the Sherman Antitrust Act. You'll see this abbreviated today as SATA. SATA. And this is the anti-monopoly bill, but remember, at this time, trusts were synonymous with monopolies. And this is a key year. New Jersey had just changed their law to allow for, remember, holding companies? Now, they haven't quite had the big wave of mergers, but this could, like, the sense is coming. And the dominance that monopolies have, especially railroads, but it's coming in oil and other things, we're just really starting to be known. So this, right on the top, said, no illegal restraint of trade. Now, it didn't quite make it illegal. It was really complex. Laws are written in very interesting ways on purpose. But basically what it meant is monopoly is equal restraint. If you have a monopoly or there's one business in one area, they get key competition out. They could jack up prices or charge their suppliers more. Remember, monospony. And so the idea of this one was to avoid monopolies and force companies that are either are a monopoly to break up or don't allow them to merge. The problem was it said this, but the law was written in such a way that nobody understood the law. And to this day, the law is just chaos. It's totally indecipherable. It never really defines what a monopoly is. And it has no real tools to enforce. It's a problem that exists to a day, today. Technically, the Justice Department has to bring a lawsuit up. 
Uh, they'd be strengthened during the uh, Wilson administration. But it's a really, really, really confusing bill. Yeah. Actually, okay, they broke up. There was a big nationwide tele telephone company in DC, and they broke that up in 1980. There was a power company in Montana called Montana yeah. Power. Yeah. But that was a legal mono regulated monopoly. And what happened is the state of Montana uh, deregulated the energy market, thinking that would lower energy costs. And the company, um, they basically uh, sold everything out. Um, to their stockholders and tried, started a phone company. That went out of business. But you, you're kind of, it's called Touch America. Yeah. They sold it out to Northwestern Energy and prices did not go down the way they thought. You know, it was, I don't know if you work in Montana politics. Yeah, it, it was related to monopolies. I know that's kind of a, it's hard to say how big, what a big deal Montana Power was and it's just gone. So with that, they couldn't enforce it. In fact, for the first 20 years of the Sherman Antitrust Act, virtually every case brought up against restricted trade were against labor unions. And that is completely against the intent, at least what most people thought the law was going to be about. And so the point is, ICC, disappointment. Sherman Silver Purchasing Act, disappointment. SATA, disappointment. And then the McKinley tariff. Another senator, soon to be governor of Ohio, William McKinley. He was prominent because he, he was from Ohio and looked like a politician should in the 1890s. That's a big deal. Shouldn't be, but it is. They promised to cut tariffs. And the whole thought was tariffs were keeping foreign competition out there, raising prices, raising profits. And so here is supposed to be generic politician. Have you ever played one of those games where you hit Try to hit the bell on top, use the sledgehammer. Have anyone played that? By the way, if you do, this might shock you. They're rigged. Did I just blow your mind? Well, this is supposed to be trust. Remember, that's monopolies. And the hammers, the tariff. And what are they doing? It's hard to see, but that's a face. And so they're pounding workers and farmers with tariffs. And when the McKinley tariff came up, it was going to be a cop. The first bill proposed in the House, a cut. The proposed in the Senate, a cut. With your committee, tariff cut, tariff cut, tariff cut, tariff cut. So in the newspaper, you find newspaper articles, well, tariff cut, tariff cut, tariff cut. And then they signed the bill. And what did the bill do? Yeah, I was just kidding about the tariff cut. It raised tariffs. It raised tariffs by almost 25%. Cut, 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 raise it. And this convinced many farmers, but others too, that this, the whole system is completely great. ICC didn't do what they say. No inflation. It was clear right away this was going to do nothing about monopoly. It's no coincidence that just a few years later, every state changed their law to be like New Jersey, and merger mania began. And then this, a total lie. And so the system is rigged. We need a third party. Now, third parties have a very serious disadvantage. We've talked about this, winner take all. But that's going to lead to directly the People's Party. And it's going to start in 1891, no coincidence, after those three laws that turned out to be disappointments. So they're going to have a, a campaign for the 1892 election. And they're called the People's Party, but everybody called them the Populist Party. And this really was a party that was not the elite. Boy, did the elite um, in both political parties just hammer them as being a bunch of hicks and yokels. They really hit that a bunch of dumb farmers. So these were mostly farmers and miners. They never could appeal because of the urban-rural divide, the workers in the city. Intensely anti-social Darwinistic. But I should say, except for some of the racial elements, and their thought was they liked the system, capitalism. They said it quite vocally. But we got to reform. Or there'll be something else. 
So these are people trying to save it. Now, of course, their opponents will say they're trying to destroy it, but this is their goal, to save it. And this is a card that's kind of mocking them, but it's all these different groups that created the patchwork, and that's why the balloons were kind of a big deal in the 1890s. And that's where you got the Farmers Alliance, the Knights of Labor, the Granger Party, um, the Silver and the Greenback Party wanted inflation, the Prohibition Party, little tiny third parties, the remnants of the Knights. But a couple of things, two really big elements that they fought for. They wanted real democracy. They wanted people to decide a safer election system to open up the ballot to more people. Not plutocracy. Plutocracy means rule by who? And they thought the wealthier ruling because it's 1890. Look what happened in 1890. They got what they wanted, not the people. That's what they're arguing. And then the concept of social morality. As they said, they look at it like this. Community, us, more important than property. You can't do whatever you want with your wealth. And so, like railroad monopolies or other monopolies, but the big one, they're, they're farmers. Land monopolies, go and go on the big plantations, remember sharecropping instead of farmers. That's who they're talking about. And don't forget, the people who were alive in 1892, it was in their lifetime that much of the land that is under private ownership by citizens of the United States was taken from somebody else. And so to their point of view, land ownership was kind of fluid. Now, they didn't want to give it back to the people who originally had it, the American Indian. They wanted more for themselves, but still, they lived in that lifestyle where they literally, people came in and conquered this land and took it. Well, a couple other things about it. They were intensely anti-urban. So they never could appeal. They saw that the big city people looked down upon us, and they saw that it's a dirty place, scary place an intensely anti-immigrant, which would have been natural allies. There's also this anti-intellectual, like these elites who are writing these tricky laws are the ones who are tricking them into debt. These intellectual elite, they call them pointy heads. These bunch of pointy heads are telling us what to do. And there is this anti-intellectual elite um, that goes on to this day. And a lot of, uh, of anti uh like higher education stuff to this day, and and all kinds of people. But it's kind of this anti-elite, and they were intensely anti-Semitic because of that um, myth about the Jewish thing. And remember, there's a mark. I've mentioned this before about the large number of Jewish immigrants at this time. Even though most of the immigrants had nothing when they got here, there's this all these conspiracy theories that Jews were trying to take over the world. This was an intense anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish time. And this was the time, as I mentioned before, they were dividing everyone up into races. And so that was considered a different race. I was going to say 39 different races, but it was more like hierarchy. We're going to talk about the hierarchy of races. And they also said Slavs were a different race than Northern Europeans. Italians were a different race. They're dividing everybody up. So with that, it's a complex thing. This is one of the things about it. You get all the, uh, the it's, it's a complex element. But let's get to this. We have to get to the Omaha and the platform. This is the populist platform of the People's Party. They met in beautiful Omaha. Why? Because Omaha is the crossroads to the world. Maybe the most cosmopolitan town anywhere. I know some of you might be saying New York or or Tokyo, or London. No, it's Omaha, Nebraska. Who's with me? Yeah, who's been to Omaha? See, we know, right? Omaha's amazing. My mom was born in Omaha. So. But, farm, yeah, I, this is the real big hot Kansas, actually, really big Kansas, and Omaha. This is like the hotbed of populism. The populism is going to be really popular in Montana. Think about it. Farmers and miners, right? Miners love populism because silver. 
So if they want inflation, let's look at this platform because we've got to get to the platform because this is different, even though they have some elements similar to socialism, it's different than laissez-faire. It is pro-capitalist, but it's different. So first off, inflation. Why is it red? Why not? They wanted the free coinage of silver or the printing of greenbacks. But a lot of Americans were uncomfortable with paper money. That was not backed by gold. Not realizing how volatile it was to be backed on some other entity you don't own. But free silver meant the free coinage. Have the government buy the silver like the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act and then coin it. That's what they want. Inflation. Prices go up so they can pay back their debts. They didn't want high inflation, they wanted some inflation. Next, they're intensely anti-bank. Intensely anti-bank. Nobody likes the person they own money to. So they wanted public banks, either controlled by state governments or the federal government through the post office. And up until the 1970s, you could go get a savings account in a post office. And they're kind of bringing that back because we have such a shortage of banks in some areas. It'd be low cost banking because banking is really expensive. And a couple states actually did state owned banks. In North Dakota, they still have state owned banks. Just, um, and when the financial crisis of 2008 hit, their banks did fairly well because they don't have the same kind of profit considerations. But they want to take it out of private hands. They hated bankers. I mean, I want to be very clear about this. Next, antitrust, anti-monopoly. Next, public control of industries that people rely on. They needed them for their survival as things change. And so things like railroads, Telephone, the brand new telephone and, tele and telegraph is still used, but telephone. And electricity was hard to use at all, but they could see how important electricity was going to be. Now, we don't know. It's complex. Do they really want like public ownership, um, public stock ownership? Do they want regulation? As we see with the ICC, there could be problems with regulation. But next, direct election of senators. State assemblies voted for senators. They wanted the Constitution changed to allow voters to pick the senators. Now, while we mention this now, yeah, these things would happen in some way. A lot of them would go away again. They also wanted a secret ballot. They wanted safer, fair elections. It was really common, not only about machines, but employers would have all their workers go and vote together and they would make it very clear this is who you're voting for if you like your job all voting was done in public you voted right in front of somebody so sure you could be intimidated or more commonly fired next a progressive income tax now there's it doesn't say anything about income tax in the constitution simply because that was pre our concept of income there was a tax on income during the Civil War, but the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional because it never said the word income tax. So they wanted an amendment. And progressive means the higher your income, the higher percentage of tax you pay. Now, there's lots of reasons for this. But the big thing the populace said is that they wanted, if you tax really big incomes heavily, that would be less in incentive to pocket big fortunes and more incentive to uh, put money back into your business, a.k.a. raise wages. So that's what they said. So they won't put in pocket all the money, so they put more money back in the business, investment, and that will lead to um, rising wages. So, and this kind of happened. The highest time of income growth in American history would be in the 1950s and 60s. 1960s. And does anybody know the highest marginal income tax rate? 91%. Now, no one paid 91% of their income. These are marginal rates, and I'll show you how that worked. But that's three times higher than today. And that was the highest wage growth. And so that was what they wanted. Now, you can make the argument that might take away from investment and other things, but that's what they wanted. Next, they're very pro union. The problem was, 
Union members didn't trust him. Because a lot of populists didn't like him. But they wanted the eight hour work day. They wanted in child labor and they wanted an old age pension. Don't forget, the concept of retirement did not exist until the Industrial Revolution. And you had more and more people who were too old to work, too young to die. That was always the same. You know, before you worked as a family on your farm or, or your cottage industry, you worked until you couldn't work anymore and then you lived with your family. That would all change with the Industrial Revolution. The world we have now is kind of being created. And they also pushed for women and civil rights. One of the big leaders of the populist movement was uh, um, Mary Lees of Kansas. And so they had a lot of women who led, and they also wanted equal rights for, for African Americans because they wanted to appeal to um, a lot of their policies would appeal to sharecroppers. But they also had a big racist element, too. This was a confusing party. Yeah, Mary Lisa's famous saying was, raise less corn and more hell. And so, with that, and remember, she couldn't vote. But she was still an incredibly, incredibly influential leader. And so that is it. And this is going to be the beginnings of an alternative view towards capitalism as compared to laissez-faire, but certainly not more of the, the socialist prescription. And this will be the beginnings of what we'll call liberal economics. Now, it will become progressive, and then in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt called it liberal, which actually, liberal actually meant more social Darwinistic, but he called it liberal, and that kind of stuck. And to Roosevelt, it's the liberal is the middle between fascism and communism. That's, so that's where that term comes from. But once again, it's just a term. Don't read too much into the meaning of the term. So with that, 1892, there's going to be a third part. Harrison's going to run for president, and they are really sticking to laissez-faire. Laissez-faire economics is now becoming the most important part of Republican politics and most Democrats. Cleveland said he was anti-monopoly, and he was pretty laissez-faire, and nobody really trusted him after the ICC. So here's another cartoon for Puck magazine. And I like this one because it has Uncle Sam and Lady Columbia. And is she going to stand up to the snake of Monopoly with its tentacles around the Capitol? I think that's a pretty good cartoon. And then for reasons I can't explain, I put James Weaver of the populace way down there. So there's going to be a third party. But don't forget, winner take all. Third parties have a really hard time. Who are the populists? If you vote for a populist, that might take away votes from which political party? Probably more Democrats. Even though there were a number of Republicans who agree with that, and we're pumped up when we get to the, pop, the progressive era. But the populists are going to do really well, out of the blue, from nowhere. So when the election returns finally came out, Cleveland would win. Re-election, become the first president to ever do what? Be elected, lose, then come back and win again. So serve non-consecutive terms. And he won a pretty big victory in the uh, popular vote after winning a, a very tight victory and a pretty big electoral vote. But look how many electors the populace got. Out of the blue. And they took over a number of state governments. They did really well in the brand new state of Montana. Really well. There was a lot of populist influence in Montana's laws to this day. And so with that, um, yeah, big victory. Oh. And this has only happened once. President Trump, uh, Looks like he's going to run for re-election again, so he's going to try. I think there are age issues, but he's going to try. So I, this, this could happen again. So with that, and then the whole thing blow, blew up. Why not, right? Disaster hit. The Panic of 1893. Once again, there's oversupply issues with railroads. They way overbuilt railroads. 
way far with railroads. So that caused the recession. Without a doubt, the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act might have pushed it back a year by pumping that money in. But the big one was a massive speculative bubble. And they started coming up with these uh, financial instruments, kind of like bonds, but they called them trusts. I know there's so many different definitions of trust. That people were buying these, st uh, these stocks or bonds thinking they'll save their money. And it turned out to be very insecure. By the way, that's why they call it stocks and bonds. You buy them thinking you, your money will be safe, and that's why they're called securities. We'll come back. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Are these after the last... oh, this is just the country, the expansion of the country in North Korea. So when the economy started going a little bit stronger, they thought, well, okay, boy, we're really going to start pushing a lot of steel and people. And so they overproduced. And here is another from Puck Magazine showing the flim flam finance. You ever heard the term flim flam before? That means kind of shaky, crooked. You'll see similar things in 1929. They were called investment trusts, almost the same thing. Just crazy things that people would buy hoping to secure their money. In 2007, 2008, there were things called credit default swaps. I know all of you know about credit default swaps, right? They're called that so no one knows what you're buying. But you think it's worth something. It's a form of derivative, that's another thing for down the road. But then when Cleveland took office, he said, I'm gonna repeal. He asked Congress and the new Democratic majority to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. That's the SSPA. So they repealed it. Now, it kind of made sense because they made the very large argument. We're just piling silver in basements. But literally, overnight, just as the economy is beginning to fade and we're starting to get cutbacks and profits dropping, the U.S. government took $4.5 million they're putting into the economy every month, stopped it, pulled it back. And that was a big hit on demand just as demand was falling. And so, alone, that you might argue that's a good law, but at that moment, it helped make the panic worse by pulling that money out of circulation. You know, people were expecting that money. Yes, Butte had a major crash, but fortunately, electricity was just picking up. Helena was hit hard by this. And so, with that, and the real fear was this panic was so bad, this might be the trigger of revolution. It went worldwide like a lightning bolt. And there is going to be economic disasters all over the world. A big one would be in Japan, and that would trigger a war with China. It almost triggered war between Britain and France, and who knows how history would be different. They would have fought a war 20 years before World War I. Russia and Britain almost fought a war. I mean, this was huge. This is kind of, this is actually a really amazing time in history. So when we have, when the exam is done, the AK exam, we will have a croissant day. What do you think? That sound like a good day? Don't let me forget. But you have to tell me where croissants come from. So, where do croissants come from? Right. No? Nope. No, nope. sure. croissants. Um, sorry. Um, so I was gone the day we turned. Yeah. I was gone the day we turned in our our um, like schedule stuff. So I'm still trying to do classes and turning in tomorrow. So I would, I'm torn between um, advanced theater and special topics for my last um, option. I think you would like both. I know you like theater, and I think you would like special topics. I really. I think you would love special topics. And so one, I I'm thinking about being a math or history teacher. So like, and I mean, I would still do all the plays and stuff in theater. So I talked to Brooklyn, and she said either one. If like she knows I already have a passion for theater, so she honestly you, thought history would ignite something and help me go further and try it. But I just didn't know what the class. Like I know the basis of the class. But. Well, you know, I, I let the class choose topics, and then we sometimes it's just a, a we do a class, 
Um, sometimes we have other people do research, they pick a topic and they do a presentation with the class about various things. Like we're doing cults next, so they're going to pick a cult, learn about it again, do a presentation. And so that's kind of how I organize the class. And so, you know, it's a lot of fun that way. They get a pick, you know, we do some serious topics. And then cult, I know it's serious, but it's kind of a light topic for that. And so that's how we set up. I mean, I, I mean it to be a, a fun class. Okay. Yeah, actually, we're doing 19. They had to come up with their own movie title for a 50s horror movie. Mm -hmm. like so they're making a movie. Right okay. Okay. So that's what we're doing now. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you'd really like it. I think you'd have a blast. Okay. The thing about it is, is that you can work it out to be like an aid. You would. Do you like an aid for like a labor theater class just so you can do around it? Instead of I, even if I took eight elective classes, I still can't. Yeah. I can't. Because it's the same it. period. Yeah, well, and that, well, it might not be. Just take you know, it. No, but it, well, the problem is, yeah. like, like, I have my two required classes, plus I forgot to take a vocation, so I have to do that, plus my math. So, and then I have to take my two, if I'm doing a elite jazz choir, I have to take a second choir. So my last option would be... Oh, so you have eight classes right now. Like going, yeah. If I, if, so my, my last option would, I still, because I want to take one of those classes. So I'm going to do the eight classes, but I just have to choose between that. So I just, I was just trying to get a few I think you would like, I think you would like if you test your mom, but I also know if you love theater, I mean... Well, You're I mean, I'd still do like all the shows, and like I'm on the I'm on the state thespian board, so like I'm still involved in. Yeah. Well, this is what I would. Do. Okay. I would sign up for special classes. Okay. And then if you want to come back and talk about it, God, I want to be in. God, I just I gotta be a different. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 That's what I would. Do. Okay. You know, I mean, you could do it either way, but um, I just think in that way, you can always, and I would certainly understand because you love them both, and I, yeah. I understand that completely. Yeah. Okay. But that's, I think that would be a good option. Yeah. That yeah. would open up the most opportunities. So yeah. And then, and, and, and you know, God, I just, I can't get it up. Oh, to a thousand by tens. Oh wait, let's go by hundreds. By tens, that still be a lot of questions. <laughs> math is hard. You have to have a math degree. Good question. I was, I was good at math. 